that based on uh, rather vague uh, notions of theology that in every fertilized ovum there is a soul and you can't privilege the, the interests of one soul over another even if one is in a petri dish and the other is in a, a man with Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, it's, a lot has been said in this conference about science not being able to answer questions of morality. Well, I think this is a question of morality that science has answered. Uh, if you look at the details, if you look at the, the human embryos that are destroyed in stem cell research, uh, what is a three-day-old human embryo? It is a collection of 150 cells. Uh, that may sound like a lot of cells to, 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 to lay people, it does, but there are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Uh, now, we, it seems to me if, if our concern is about suffering in this universe, uh, it is rather obvious that we should be more concerned about killing flies than about killing three-day-old human embryos. Now, this, this may sound like a very provocative claim. I would argue that it shouldn't if you look at the details. Now many people of course will argue, well the difference between a fly and a three-day-old human embryo is that a, a, a three-day-old human embryo is a potential human being. Uh, this runs into problems. Every cell in your body, given the right manipulations, every cell with a nucleus is now a potential human being. I mean, literally, every time you scratch your nose, you have committed a holocaust of potential human beings. Uh, so the, the argument for, for a cell's potential doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, but let's, let's take this a little bit further. Let's say we granted that every three-day-old human embryo has a soul worthy of our moral concern. Uh, there are other problems that await this, uh, this uh, description. First of all, embryos at this stage can split into what we call identical twins. Uh, now, is this a case of, of one soul splitting into two souls? Embryos at this stage can fuse into what we call a chimera. There are many people in this room could have developed in this way. Now, I, I suspect that there are theologians trying to figure out what has happened to the extra human soul in such a case. Uh, it, it's time we realize that this arithmetic of souls doesn't make any sense. It's intellectually indefensible, but it is morally indefensible, given that these notions really are prolonging the scarcely endurable misery of tens of millions of human beings. And because, uh, because of the respect we accord religious faith, not even just people of faith, even advocates of stem cell research uh, accord this the, the faith respect, uh, we can't have this, this dialogue uh, in the way that we should. So I submit to you that if, if you think that the, the the interests of a blastocyst, a three-day-old human embryo, just may trump the interests of a little girl with spinal cord injury or, or a person with full body burns. Uh, your moral intuitions have been obscured by religious metaphysics. Uh, and this is a kind of blindness that is very well subscribed in our society. And it's a blindness that goes by another name. It goes by the name of religious faith. And we have been cowed into respecting it. I'm curious, how many of you consider yourselves to be devout Muslims? I see a show of hands. Don't mean to single anyone out, but not many. Now, you're all aware, of course, that the Quran exists and claims to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe. You're aware that once having heard of this possibility and rejecting it, you're all going to hell for eternity. I mean, needless to say, Dr. Craig and I are both going to hell if this vision of life is true. Okay, the problem is, is that everything Dr. Craig has said tonight, with a few modifications, could be said in defense of Islam. In fact, has been said in defense of Islam. Okay, the logic is exactly the same. We have a book that claims to be the word of the creator of the universe. It tells us about the nature of moral reality and how to live within it. But what if, what if Muslims are right? And what if Islam is true? Okay, how should we view God in moral terms? How would we view God in moral terms? Or I should say Allah. Okay, we, we have been born in the wrong place to the wrong parents, given the wrong culture, given the wrong theology. Okay, do, needless to say, Dr. Craig is doomed. He's been thoroughly confused by Christianity. I mean, just appreciate what a bad position he's now in to appreciate the true word of God. I've been thoroughly misled by science. 
Okay, where is Allah's compassion? Okay. And yet, in a ter- it, it, he's, omni- he's omnipotent. He could change this in an instant. He could give us a sign that would convince everyone in this room. And yet he's not going to do it. And hell awaits. And hell awaits our children because we can't help but mislead our children. Okay, now just hold this vision in mind. And, and first appreciate how little sleep you have lost over this possibility. Okay, just feel in yourself at this moment how carefree you are and will continue to be in the face of this possibility. What are the chances that we're all going to go to hell for for eternity because we haven't recognized the Quran to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe? Please know that this is exactly how Christianity appears to someone who's not been indoctrinated by it. People who make it their business to worry about proliferation full time as far as I can tell, think the odds are 50-50 that a nuke is going to go off in American City sometime in, in the next 10 years. That's really terrifying. Uh, it's also terrifying how little of our attentional and emotional and, and economic resources we're spending on trying to contain that problem. My name is Sam Harris. I'm a writer and a neuroscientist and also uh, one of the founders of The Reason Project, which is a nonprofit. Uh, purpose towards spreading secularism and scientific thinking in society. We should be talking about real problems like nuclear proliferation and, and genocide and poverty and the crisis in education. I mean, these are these are issues which which are which tremendous swings in human well-being depend on, and uh, that's it's, it's not at the at the center of our moral concern. If we talk about morality. Uh, in ways that, that, that are uncoupled from real questions of human and animal suffering. So that we, and, the, and this is the influence of religion. Religion has convinced us that there's something else entirely other than concerns about suffering. There's concerns about what God wants. There's concerns about what's going to happen in the afterlife. Uh, and therefore, we talk about things like gay marriage as though it's the greatest problem of the 21st century. Uh, we even have a liberal president who's a, ostensibly against gay marriage because it's, his faith tells him Uh, It's an abomination. Um, It's completely insane. Well, it it, it, uh, convinces people that they should pretend to know things they don't know. And it gives them bad answers to the most important questions. When someone pretends to be certain about something they obviously can't be certain about, that person is not trusted and not given a position of authority and just, it's, it's, it's unseemly. And yet, the moment you shift the conversation to God, and the, the, mor- the moral structure of the universe as, as decreed by religion, uh, then all of a sudden all bets are off. You can, you can pretend to know things you absolutely uh, and obviously cannot know. Uh, and what's worse is you, these are mutually incompatible certainties. I mean, there's, just, there's no way to reconcile Islam with Christianity. This difference of opinion admits of compromise about as much as a coin toss does because, to take only one example, uh, if you're a Christian uh, of any serious conviction, you have to believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Well, it says in two places in, in the Quran that if you believe that Christ was divine, you will go to hell. Uh, so, you know, there is no compromise there. I mean, either Jesus was divine or he wasn't. And we have a world that has been shattered by these competing uh, certainties. And we're lying to ourselves about the causes of this shattering. We have people who are saying, well, it's not really religion, it's politics. Well, it's it's only politics because it's religion first. The, the irony actually is that, that, that we actually agree much more about morality than, than anyone lets on. The issue is we, have, we do have whole cultures and subcultures that have, based largely on religious conviction, very distorted notions of how uh, human beings can flourish. I mean, we have people who uh, think you should throw acid in the battery acid in the faces of little girls for trying to learn to read in Afghanistan. And so clearly that there, that there, there are real world correlates of that kind of thinking, that kind of orientation. And uh, you know, it's not our job to to not judge it and say, well, to each his own, everyone, you know, everyone has to has to work out their own strategy for, for human fulfillment. It's just it's just not true. There's there are people who are wrong about human fulfillment.
fascists. I, I said, you know, the only people making sense on this subject at the moment happen to be fascists. And I went on to say that this is a terrifying circumstance, that we have, we have um, you know, if, if, if someone burns a Koran tomorrow and riots erupt in a in hundred countries, uh, as, they, as they likely would, the only, per, the only people who are going to immediately come forward and, and, and talk about the, the clear link between what Muslims believe and this despicable behavior are the crackpot pastors and the, the right-wing demagogues, you know, Sarah Palin and, and you know, some, some uh, uh, you know, homophobic pastor in Florida, they will actually be speaking quite sensibly about the link between doctrinal Muslim beliefs and this rioting. And then you're going to have the New York Times op-ed page and people like Reza saying this has nothing, to, and even the President of the United States, saying this has nothing to do with Islam. Well, of course it has something to do with Islam. Everything we see, everything we see about... about the character of Muslim violence, the fact that people are being decapitated as opposed to some other method of dispatching them, there's a direct link between that and Muslim doctrine. And we have to speak honestly about that. And I, I would just point out that there are Muslims doing quite heroic work, very few of them, but there are Muslims, like Majid Nawaz, mm. who, will, who will take a line uh, quite opposite of the line that, that Reza is taking, which is to, to acknowledge the role that, that, that traditional Muslim doctrines are playing, uh, is, traditional Islamic doctrines are playing in engineering this kind of violence, and then do their best to, to come up with rival interpretations and some, some kind of reformist uh, imperative within the mu Muslim community. And so I'm not saying we have to, have to just foist atheism upon the Muslim world, although uh, I am an atheist, but someone like Majid Nawaz, as a Muslim, is saying, listen, guys, we have to be honest about this. This is, the, this is coming from the Quran and the Hadith, and, and these people think they're going to get into paradise, and they're motivated by their religion, and uh, it's not a lie to say any of these things, and we as Muslims have an excruciating problem trying to reform our, our discussion about faith so as to make apostasy a non-punishable offense and blasphemy a non-punishable offense. And that's a huge challenge, and you're, but you're not going to clear that bar by lying about the 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 motives of, mm. of people, and that's what someone like Reza does. Nor by lying about what you write. And in fact, after that, that you were misconstrued after you wrote that. We did a segment on that here, which we'll put a link to so that people can check it out uh -huh. in the resource well underneath the video that we're, we're watching, where we tried to clarify exactly what you'd said. But just lastly, are you overall an, an optimist or a pessimist? You look at what's going on with ISIS. The president's going to give a speech tomorrow night. Syria and Iraq right. are, are collapsing. Um, this is the most virulent strain of Islamism that we've probably ever seen. Yeah. Um, where do we go from here? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know in terms of optimism and pessimism. I, it could clearly go either way. I think, I think, by, I think the, the truth is on the side of the right ideas, obviously. I mean, insofar as having your beliefs track reality is useful, Humanity is going to tend to keep finding uh, tr true and, and, and non-sectarian beliefs increasingly compelling. And I think insofar as we have a global conversation about anything, that conversation is going to, is going to tend to rise above the accidents of anyone's birth and the, and the distinctions between cultures. And, and that is of a, just by definition going to purify the conversation of incompatible religious Bigotry. So, so religion's going to lose the lose ground in, in, in that process, and it continually loses ground to science. There's no question upon which we once had a scientific answer, but now that now that has been ceded back to religion, and yet there are a countless number of questions where it has gone the other way. And so, it's, it's a it's a unilateral, you know, religions use, losing the tug of war with science. But you know, whether one should be optimistic about any. Uh, local political uh, reality, it's, it's hard to say. Well, from your lips to God's ears about yeah. the, uh, the overall okay. trajectory. Thanks, yeah. Sam. Great to yeah. have you on that post. Yeah, pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Come yeah. back anytime. Uh, for more information on Sam's book, uh, Waking Up, you can check out our resource well below. Stick around, of course. Plenty more conversations coming up right here on Huff. I hope to do two things in this talk. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion and that there's no way of thinking about it coherently in terms of what we now understand about the nature of reality. The problem is free will is just a non-starter philosophically and scientifically. There's no, unlike many other illusions, there's no way you can describe the universe 
so as to make sense of this notion of free will. Free will as a concept is, is so incoherent that it can't be mapped onto any conceivable reality. And I hope to persuade you that this truth matters. It actually changes something about the way we view the world. Now, the, the popular conception of free will rests on two assumptions. It, the first assumption is that each of us was free to behave differently than we did in the past. If, if you could rewind the movie of your life to some moment 10 minutes ago or 10 hours ago, 10 years ago, you would be able to proceed differently than you did. If you, if you chose A, you could have chosen B. If you became a, a firefighter, you, you could have become a policeman. You had chocolate ice cream, you could have chosen vanilla. It, it certainly seems to most of us, most of the time, that this is the universe we're living in. The, the, the second assumption is that each of us is the conscious author of our thoughts and actions. So that, so that the part of you that thinks and perceives and experiences your life in the present moment is the, actually the author of your thoughts and choices and subsequent behavior. Now, the problem, unfortunately, is that we know that both of these assumptions are false. The first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect, and either our wills are determined by a long chain of prior causes, and we're not responsible for them, or they're determined by some random influences, and we're not responsible for them. And no matter how you, you turn this dial between the iron law of determinism and randomness, this notion of free will doesn't make any more sense. There's, there's, no, there's no way of combining chance and determinism that makes sense of free will. And, and consciousness clearly is not in the driver's seat. For instance, there's, there's now a tradition of doing experiments where you give people a very simple choice just to, to push one button, the left button, or the right button. And they can, do, they can, they can push whichever they want, whenever they want. So it's, so, uh, and the only other task you give them is to watch a special clock where they can discriminate time very, uh, in a very fine-grained way. And they just have to notice what time it was when they finally consciously made up their mind. What you find, and what, what the, the first person who did this, Benjamin Labette did, a physiologist who, who had people hooked up to EEG while doing this, but it's since been replicated with functional magnetic resonance imaging and even direct recordings from the, from the cortices of, of surgical patients, you find that the time at which a person consciously decides thinks they have consciously decided to, to push the left button versus the right, come some seconds often, uh, at minimum half a second, sometimes up to five seconds or seven seconds after the brain has already decided. You can tell what the person is going to do before they know what they're going to do by looking at the, the brain data. Now obviously this gap is, is, is fundamentally hostile to the notion of free will because this means that someone could tell what you're going to do at a point in time where you think you're still making up your mind. But, and people have been wrestling with these data for years trying to collapse this interval and some imagine that they have. I'm not persuaded by any of those results. But the truth is even if you collapsed it totally and the moment your brain decides was in fact the moment that you were consciously aware of deciding, there still wouldn't be room for free will. You still wouldn't know why it is you picked left over right and you, and you wouldn't have created the conditions of your picking. You wouldn't have tuned your brain to that precise state that, that led to that behavior. Now, what does it mean to say that, that someone acted of his own free will? Well, if it means anything, it must mean that he could have done otherwise. He could have behaved differently than he did. And not based on some random influences over which he had no control, but, but because he, as the conscious subject, was in fact the author of, of his actions. But the problem is, is no, one, no one has ever found, found a way of describing how physical processes could occur that would make sense of this claim. So, so you consider your generic murderer. 
A person's choice to commit a murder is preceded by a certain pattern of electrochemical activity in his brain, which is in turn the product of prior causes, some combination of bad genes and the developmental effects of an unhappy childhood, and then whatever is impinging on his brain in, uh, in that moment. We are downstream of causes of which we're not conscious and, and cannot possibly be conscious. The moment we catch sight of this stream of causes, reaching back into this, this person's childhood and beyond, and, and out into the world beyond their skin, that his culpability seems to disappear. To, to say that he would have done otherwise, or could have done otherwise, had he wanted to, is simply to say he would have been a different person had he been a different person, or he would have lived in a different universe had he lived in a different universe. And, and as disturbing as I might find such a person's behavior, I have to admit that if I traded, if I could trade places with him, atom for atom, I would be him. I mean, there's no extra part of me that could decide to see the world differently or, or, or could decide to resist the impulse to victimize other people. And even if you believe that each of us harbors an immortal soul, this, this problem of responsibility remains. I cannot take credit for the fact that I don't have the soul of a psychopath. I didn't make my soul. If I had truly been in this person's posi position, if I had the same genes and the same brain, the same life experience, or the same soul, I would have done exactly as he did and for the same reasons. So, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. The problem of free will is actually deeper than the problem of cause and effect. Free will doesn't even correspond to a subjective fact about ourselves. Now, now most people think we have a, a subjective, a, st a strong subjective experience of free will. And the problem is just that we can't map it on to physical reality. This, I think, is an illusion. I think, I, I think we actually do not feel as free as we think we do. This, this relies on us not paying very close attention to what it's like to be us. The, the truth is we feel or presume an authorship over our actions, over certain and thoughts, over a certain channel of information in our conscious minds that is illusory. The endurance of free will as a philosophical problem in need of a solution is born of the fact that, that most of us feel that we freely author our thoughts and intentions and actions, therefore, however difficult it may be to make sense of this in logical or scientific terms. There is actually no evidence of free will in our experience. And if you pay close attention to your experience, you can see this. If you pay attention, you can see that you, you no more author the next thing you think than the next thing I say. Thoughts simply appear in consciousness. What, what, what are you going to think next? What am I going to say next? I could suddenly start talking about why we don't eat owls. Why don't we eat owls? They seem perfectly good. Okay, now, no. what, where did that come from? Okay. It, 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 came, it came out of nowhere as far as you're concerned, but the same thing is happening in your own mind at this moment. I mean, you've, you've all made an effort to be here tonight, presumably because you wanted to hear what I had to say about free will, and now you're trying to listen to me, but you also have a voice in your head that says things. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> and it, 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 says things, uh, it, it, it says things that are completely unconstrained at times by the thing you're trying to focus on. I mean, I'm, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you. <laughs> and you, you will think, he does look a little like Ben Stiller. Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. Okay, we, are, we are not authoring them. We, we can't choose them before we think them. That would require that we think them before we think them. If you, if you can't control your next thought and you don't know what it's going to be until it arises, where is your freedom of will? The, pr the, the contents of consciousness are, are born of 
an unconscious mental life. You can't honestly take credit for your unconscious mental life. You, you have, you're making millions of decisions right now with organs other than your brain, of which you're not conscious of, but you don't feel responsible for these decisions. I mean, are you making red blood cells at this moment? Now, your body is, hopefully, but if it were to stop doing this, you would be the victim of that change. You wouldn't be its author. Our experience in life is actually totally compatible with the truth of determinism. We don't have this robust sense of free will the moment we actually pay attention to how thoughts and intentions arise. And again, it's important to notice that this is true whether or not we have immortal souls. And there's no, the case I'm building against free will does not presuppose philosophical materialism. But even if we have souls, that are somehow loosely integrated with the brain, the unconscious operation of a soul grants you no more free will than the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain does. Everything you're consciously aware of in every moment is the result of causes of which you are not aware and over which you exert no conscious control. So, so how can we be free as conscious agents if everything that we consciously intend is caused by things we did not intend and of which we are entirely unaware. We can't. We can't choose what we choose in life. And, and, what we, and when it seems that we choose what we choose, so perhaps when going back and forth between two options, we don't choose to choose what we choose. <laughs> I mean, that, there is a regress here that, that ends in darkness. Yeah, yes, you are free to do whatever you want, but where do your desires come from? The next choice you make is going to come out of a wilderness of prior causes which you can't see and didn't bring into being. Where is the freedom in doing what one wa wants when one's wants are the product of prior causes which one cannot inspect and therefore could not choose, and, and one had absolutely no hand in creating. And so, and what I'm going to do next remains a mystery that is fully determined by a prior state of the universe. For, from the perspective of your conscious mind, you are actually no more responsible for your next thought than you are for your, your birth into this world. You have not built your mind. And in moments where you seem to build it, where you finally take the reins of your life and, and, you, and you, you decide to acquire knowledge or, or learn a new skill, the only tools at your disposal are those which you've inherited from moments past. No one picks their parents or the, or the society to which they were born. No one picks the moment in history in which they live. No one picks their genes or their, the environmental influences that determine the structure of their brain. No one determines how their nervous system gets shaped from the moment of conception onward. Your physical development is something you had no hand in. You didn't pick any of the influences that's, that shaped your neurophysiology. You didn't pick your soul, if you have one. And yet th this totality of influences and states will be the thing that produces your next decision. Just think of the context in which you are going to make your next decision. Your brain is making choices based upon beliefs and intentions and states that have been hammered into it over a lifetime. You, you are no more responsible for the, the exact structure and state of your brain in this moment than you are for your height. What you, what you do based on conscious, predetermined decisions says more about you than anything else. Thoughts simply arise in the mind. But the, the idea that we as conscious beings are deeply responsible for the characters of our minds simply can't be mapped onto reality. And if we want to be guided by reality rather than by the fantasy lives of our ancestors, I think we have to revise our view. Thank you very much. The argument is called the stimulation argument, and he argues that uh, 
we are all very likely not, to, not living in a real universe, but living in a simulated universe. Uh, and we are being simulated on the hard drives of computers of the future. Uh, now he gets there with a few simple steps. You, uh, you simply have to acknowledge that consciousness is at bottom the result of information processing at the level of the brain, and there's nothing magical about brains. It could be information processing in a computer of, uh, of the future. Uh, most scientists think, that, think that's true. They don't think there's anything magical about the wet stuff in our heads, uh, and that consciousness is at some point uh, going to be instantiated in computers. Uh, then you simply have to grant that humans of the future will run simulations of the past in the way that we run simulations, uh, you know, sims, games, and, um, and then there's just one short move, that, that simulated universes, by, almost by definition, will outnumber real universes. And therefore, we are a lot more likely to be among the simulated ancestors than the real ancestors. Now again, this is, this, everyone acknowledges it seems a little crazy, but, there's, but the assumptions that you, have to, you take, take on board are not, not so weak. Um, and I would add to this uh, the somewhat disconcerting idea that if in fact we are running as a simulation on a computer of the future, uh, this computer could have been built by Mormons or Scientologists who would want to simulate the truth of their religion. Um, and therefore, all religions could be true in this simulated universe. And we could expect to see Jesus coming back in, in clouds of glory and move into Missouri as the, as the uh, Mormons expect. Uh, so now all of that sounds completely crazy, but it is not as crazy as the, the version of the afterlife.